It's uh, 6 p.m. on the dot, and we want to make sure we maximize our time this evening with our tremendous speaker. So on behalf of the School of Kinesiology and Recreation at Illinois State University, I'd like to welcome you to the 2021 Esther Larson McGinnis Scholar Lecture. My name is Tracy Maneri. I'm a faculty member in the School of KNR, and I've been honored to be part of the 2021 ELM Scholar Lecture Planning Committee. I want to be sure to recognize my other, the other committee members, Nikki Hoffman, Yun Chang, uh, and Skip Williams. Uh, wouldn't be here uh, tonight without the hard work of, of this committee, as well as um, some, some folks not on the committee who just provided a tremendous amount of support leading up to this evening, including our school director, Brent Beggs, our Pete faculty member, Emily Jones, and Terry Jordan and Peggy Cundy, who did such great job supporting all the things that go on behind the scenes to make a lecture like this happen. So thank you to all of you and for all of you for being here this evening. Just wanna give you a preview for what's in store for us this evening. We're looking forward to an evening of learning and dialogue with our tremendous scholar lecturer. Um, for those interested, I am going to go ahead and drop the link to the program for this evening into the chat so you can take a look at it. Um, and to start us off, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brent Beggs, Director of the School of Kinesiology and Recreation, to provide some welcoming remarks. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, good evening. And uh, on behalf of the School of Kinesiology and Recreation and the College of Applied Science and Technology, welcome to the 2021 Esther Larson McGinnis Scholar Lecture. My name is Brent Beggs, and I have the honor of serving as the director of the School of Kinesiology and Recreation. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to acknowledge some of the same, the same people that Tracy just acknowledged, um, our lecture committee of, of Dr. Maneri Chong Hoffman and Assistant Director Williams, uh, who worked to organize and prepare for this year's scholar lecture. Also, Dr. Emily Jones and then our administrative staff, Peggy Kundi and Terry, Terry Jordan, for their help making this event possible. You know, moving to a webinar and a day full of online activities took considerable planning. So thank you all for your efforts. Esther Larson McGinnis graduated from the department of Hyper at ISU in 1946 and became a physical educator in the state of Illinois. Uh, she willed a portion of her state to the department of Hyper, which is now known as the School of Kinesiology and Recreation, and indicated that she wanted this gift to support women's PE. So based on this request, the School of KNR invites a prominent female scholar to campus each October to share her expertise with students, faculty, alumni, the university and surrounding community. And we certainly thank all of you for being here with us this evening. This is our 25th scholar lecture and is one of the highlights of the academic year for the School of Kinesiology and Recreation. So if you downloaded the program, um, and if you haven't, you should, uh, you can see on the last page of the program, the past lectures for this event. They're world-renowned experts in various areas of kinesiology, recreation, sport, health, and wellness. Tonight's speaker is no exception, and she certainly adds to the prestige of this impressive list. So at this time, I'll pass it back to Dr. Maneri to go over some Zoom basics and introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beggs. Now, just a few housekeeping items to um, go over. As we go throughout tonight, we welcome your engagement in tonight's events. Please feel free to use the chat feature to interact with your fellow attendees, as well as the hosts throughout the night. If you have questions specifically for Dr. Costelli, we ask you place them in the Q&A window of our webinar. Dr. Nikki Hoffman will moderate a Q&A session with Dr. Costelli directly following her lecture. And so we wanna make sure to have all of your questions there in one place. Now for the students in the audience who are here as part of one or more of your KNR classes, We'll be using the Zoom attendance log to confirm your attendance. Also near the end of the lecture, I'll share a quick form for you to sign in for the lecture. Both the logs and the form will be distributed to your KNR professors, so you have nothing to worry about there. Enough of housekeeping stuff, now it's on to our exciting main event, our ELM Scholar Lecture. I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. 
Dr. Darla Castelli is a professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Education at the University of Texas at Austin, where she also serves as the director of Kinetic Kids Lab. Dr. Caselli has worn many hats in the span of her career, from physical education teacher, to coach, to athletic director, to assistant principal, to researcher, and the list goes on and on. She has received numerous teaching awards in both public education and in higher education, as well as numerous awards and grants for her research. Her signature projects are marked by incredible cross-disciplinary collaboration, and vital community-driven initiatives. Her scholarly work has focused on the effects of physical activity and metabolic risk factors on cognitive health and understanding how physical activity can reverse the effects of health risk. She has even presented her expertise in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. Congress and Senate briefings. We are a tremendous company tonight. In addition to these many accolades, which I could talk about for quite a bit more time, I've come to learn firsthand why Dr. Castelli stands out as a tremendous scholar, educator, and mentor. In talking to my Pete faculty colleagues and seeing her work with our students today, Dr. Castelli's mark on our field centers around relationship building and a passion for the power of movement to change lives and communities. She sees connections where many do not and builds coalitions that bring people together from a wide range of disciplines and professions. She believes in the joy of movement and in helping youth and others find that same joy. Her passion is infectious in the best ways possible. Indeed, this morning, as she shared insights about the physical education teacher profession with some of our Pete students, she encouraged them to quote, invite people to be part of our world. We are so honored to have Dr. Caselli invite us into her world tonight. Without further ado, please help me welcome the 2021 Esther Larson McGinnis Scholar Lecturer, Dr. Darla Castelli. Thank you so much for your kind words, Tracy. Um, I am humbled and honored, and I appreciate all the hard work of the planning committee and selection committee. Um, I've had a wonderful day interacting with all of the students, and um, I, I thank you uh, for being here this evening and taking time out of your evening uh, to share uh, your, be in my presence as well, and to share this experience together. Let me try sharing my screen one more time. I didn't quite grab the right screen. Excellent. And let me call up the chat just so that I can look at that. The title of my talk tonight is Bridging Science, Bringing Science Home as a UT Austin Bridging Barrier. It's entitled Whole Communities, Whole Health, and it's an initiative that's transdisciplinary in nature. And it also draws upon my lived experiences as well as the expertise and things that I've learned through research. There it is, there's the burnt orange. Um, you knew that I had to sneak it in there for the burnt orange. Uh, this project is funded by the University VP Officer for Research. And the VP Office for Research solicited fundings from the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. So I'd like to thank both of them um, as I begin my remarks tonight. Tonight, we'll discuss three parts. And the first part is, what is this whole community's whole health um, initiative? And, and what makes it so unique? Um, everyone is doing good work. And why is it that I think this particular project is, has the potential for impact and sustainability I also like to share some of our findings along the way and talk to you about how the, our work as well as your work might transform communities through the notion of engagement and physical activity. I believe that any initiative ultimately has to be contextually and culturally grounded. And our initiative is no different from that. Texas is a microcosm of what we believe the United States is emerging to become. 
11% of all US children are born in the state of Texas. So we're responsible for a 10th of the population um, under the age of 18. We have a high military population in Texas, but we also have some characteristics which are not necessarily aligned with the mantra of bigger and better. As a matter of fact, it's quite embarrassing that Texas ranks 43rd overall among child well being. We are the worst in the country with health disparities. We think of the border with Mexico as a deficit, opposed to thinking of it as a strength and of individual talents of people who have come to settle in the United States. We also have 25% of Texas children are living impoverished. To address these concerns, we took on what was called the grand challenge. And who is we? We is a transdisciplinary team. So interdisciplinary is you take two disciplines and you bring them together. But transdisciplinary goes across multiple disciplines where we find that sweet spot where we all have something in common. We're scholars who care. We're community members who are invested. They're nonprofit organizations. There are also community partners such as school teachers, um, can, uh, recreation specialists uh, are all involved in the project as well. Our focus is to better understand children's health and to help those children thrive. In addition to that, we also wanna challenge our thinking about what scientific research models need to look like. So our research models have tradi traditionally been this notion of we will exclude individuals, we will bring them to our lab, we'll have a treatment and a control group, and we wanted to shatter that model and think about our communities where people reside and allow those community members to be co-researchers, to be co-planners, to present the research questions that we were actually going to study. So we called this bringing science home and helping children thrive. It is a 10-year initiative, and we are currently in the third year of that initiative. You can see from my co-collaborators that we represent 12 different disciplines, and we also represent 24 different units across the university. And I'm the only one in pedagogy, and I'm the only one who represents physical education and physical activity, and I'm proud of it. Our goals, as you can see, were not only to consider children from a physical health perspective, a social and emotional well being, our community health and environmental health, but we also sought to create an equity centered approach where while we were doing conducting research, we could gather data that could help the families ultimately advocate to meet their own needs. So to create a system where it wasn't up to the researchers who were on campus to resolve the issues, we helped to facilitate solutions of the problems from a community member ground up approach. Focused on individuals, a Latinx uh, community uh, that was traditionally has been excluded from research. And again, we did this from a multidisciplinary um, partnership with the community members. A nonprofit called Measure Austin taught us in our first um, initial meetings about the care model and what our role was going to be in the care model. As we as a research team of those 12 uh, researchers, ultimately our responsibility was to provide the evidence. But we wouldn't do so in isolation in our labs and doing our own research. We would collaboratively think more deeply from a medical standpoint, a psychological standpoint, a physical standpoint about how this evidence that we gathered would ultimately influence the community, allow communities to advocate and build resilience among families. Braun from Brenner's um, socio-ecological model um, provided the framework for the work that we were going to do. We have a primary child of interest who is grounded within a family. We call the family a group of people who live together in a dwelling and happen to love each other and reside there. Um, we did not put any other definitions on what family might be like. That allowed us to take a contemporary perspective on the study of over 300 families in, this, in these five-year period. 
We also collected biological, environmental, mental health, family relationships data. This is everything from surveys all the way to sensible sensors and wearable devices. Um, the sensors were placed in the home that actually looked at allergens within the home. We also have wearable devices on the children um, as well as family members. Family members got to opt in to the type of variables that they were interested in having being part of as a study. So it was not, it was the complete opposite of a top-down approach and intervention designed by a bunch of researchers in, uh, at the university who then said, we know best and uh, we're going to engage your family from this perspective to ultimately participate in physical activity and improve your physical and mental health. No, our co-planners came up with the idea. Our co-planners who are the community members and families with whom we work. And this is a very different way of thinking. They are now researchers like us, and they are citizen scientists in a little bit of a way because they're wearing the wearable device that gives them the feedback in that moment. Well, we were on our way um, two years into the mission, a global pandemic hit. But one of the things that drove home uh, the importance of this project more than ever before was this map displays the fact that there were health disparities and the amount of families of color who were influenced by the pandemic and how they didn't have access to the vaccines like we did on campus. Um, we're proud to say that we have 90% of the faculty and 75% of the students vaccinated on campus, but five miles away, I could run that distance on a really good day. Five miles away, they did not have access to vaccines. So the first thing that we did is our engineers build a website that allowed us to track contact trace um, to also track those who had been vaccinated, which communities needed the vaccine. And we worked with our school of nursing to then and Vamos, uh, a, a local um, nonprofit to provide vaccine clinics right in the community. This community uh, of particular interest to us um, is unincorporated. It's 240 square miles. There is no downtown. There's no central or city government. They do have a single school district, which oversees um, the, the district. Uh, they do not have a grocery store. They have a, a Dollar Tree um, and they have a Dollar General. They have the two dollar stores. They do have Travis County EMS. Um, and again, our School of Nursing has a mobile clinic that goes out into this community. So in engaging that community, we felt it was imperative that the known entities and partners that we already were working with, such as the School of Nursing and EMS, were a critical piece um, to not only extending vaccines into the clinic, but being responsive to the emergent needs as we engage them in research. So it was a home and a clinic and a school uh, locations that triangulation between the three of those, those were the primary sources. We found this really neat sweet spot here in our partner's role, where ultimately the relationships that we built through our community engagement, whether it's tabling or whether it was a vaccine clinic or it was a wellness dentistry clinic, which we actually discovered. We had Central Texas Food Bank come in. The connection of resources to the relationship led to the notion of these are really important data that we need to collect. We need to demonstrate that there are disparities here and we need to act on those disparities. Um, vaccine clinic is just one example of all of that. We shared human resources and physical capital and we co-planned events together. We are now in this phase here where we are res conducting research and studying the variables of environment, physical health and mental health, as well as biology, which may impact the lives of children. Hopefully we get to this last stage here where there is a better understanding and there's sustained engagement, agency and autonomy among a group um, that is still uh, for sure a work in progress. We lean heavily on our community strategy team. It has 12 members who all live in Travis County. They are parents. They are key stakeholders within the community. They might be the CEO of a law, local nonprofit. And there are 52 different partners who we've engaged. And I just want to give you one example. Um, in the community, we have 911 for emergency calls. We have 311, and then we have 211. 
the 311 calls, we utilize that data to then say what were hotspots for COVID. And we also use 311 data to set up food distribution centers. 211 data, um, or uh, somebody had trouble paying their utilities, that's 311. 211 is a little bit more, my child doesn't have a bed. Does anybody have any extra ones? We connected the 211 um, data to ultimately the United Way and to um, Goodwill, and both of them were responsive to the concerns that emerges from the community. So we're collecting data simultaneously, and then we're responding. It thus creates these tensions between rigorous science and then the notion of stewardship and serving your community. How can you actually do and ultimately do an intervention um, if you know you're intervening in a way that hmm, you know you're kind of messing with uh, the individuals, like you're manipulating them by providing food and other resources. Well, let me tell you about some of the findings. Um, from our pilot studies, and then I'll, I'll let you be the judge to determine that. We had a household survey, photo voice project, PE toolkits, Project Smart, and coming soon, the Horn Sense app. We also have five more projects, mindfulness in schools, um, a mental health intervention with new mothers. Um, I didn't have time to speak about all of those tonight, so I'm just going to highlight these few here. With the School of Nursing, we actually distributed uh, 300 surveys to families. We had a team of researchers who visited 100 of those households. And the first thing that we discovered was that 65% of the school children in this community did not have access to high-speed, reliable internet. So 65% had access, but 3,000 of the 11,000 did not have reliable access. Most of that access was through the cell phone and on a very limited data plan. So we discovered this pre-COVID. And then when we, on March 13th, 2020, when we were sent to social isolation and the schools closed, um, we helped the schools to respond with hotspots. Uh, and Chromebooks to ultimately address this concern. We had hotspots on buses, we had hotspots in um, EMS uh, locations. We also responded eventually with the extension of the social isolation and the pandemic, care packages, food distribution, a mental health hotline set up by some of our undergraduate students who were on the verge of being certified um, in their work, their social work, uh, and also physical education toolkits. You see a list before you, the primary concerns from the Latinx families, um, and they had at least one uh, family member who was the primary child of interest. So that child was either zero to nine years old. And these were the concerns that emerged. We had not anticipated that water and air quality were going to be a concern. And um, that was a, a surprise. And it also um, shifted our thinking just a little bit in the data collection to also collect water and dust samples. You know, we're not unique, um, Hal Lawson, and as a matter of fact, Dr. Emily Jones has, has been uh, published some articles on this. We're not unique in our thinking that, you know, there are these systems and there's consequences of the systems that we build. You know, are we our own worst enemy in physical education by being uninviting, by being too competitive? So I ask us to step back and think about how can physical education be a proactive, pro-social, um, positive entity within the lives of children to ultimately help them to thrive. Um, our current systems are just constrained and quite often it's, it's not uh, the teacher, it's some sort of barrier or inhibitor that they faced. School violence, mental health issues, not enough resources, one teacher for multiple schools, one teacher with 50 students um, in the gym gymnasium simultaneously. But yet, as I heard today, there's hope. There absolutely is hope. And I think that's the perspective that we need to have. We identify the barriers and then we address the barriers and that need. We did a summer project called Photo Voice. Uh, we put cameras in the hands of um, school children they, who were involved in an after school program. This was actually the PEAT doctoral students um, who uh, engaged in this project. The students were third through fifth grade. They were, you know, divided, um, half male, half female. But we really focused on those who self-identified as a Hispanic culture 
because we wanted to learn more about their perceptions of health. If we were going to engage in understanding the health of children and then be responsive to their needs, I wanted to know what the children were thinking. So they used their camera and we took them through a series of almost professional developments like mini workshops. This is how you use a camera. These are appropriate pictures. These are inappropriate pictures. Carry the picture, the, carry the camera with you and take pictures in your home environment that actually to you represent health. And the first pictures that we got were about cigarette butts and trash and it's wrong to smoke and somebody should really pick up that trash in the park and there's broken glass. So children had some conceptions of health, but then others were like, what was the source or the reason why that might be unhealthy and what we, can we do about that? So we drew upon that and then the physical education, teacher education, doctoral students started a series of little mini sessions about what might healthy eating actually look like? Why is your room a safe place? What is it about that? And what makes for positive relationships? So here's Yasselin. I took a picture of my new home because it's healthy. My old home had a fire and it was not a nice place to live. We only have a picture of her new home and we only have her comments of her old home. These were many of the comments that we got from the children. The last thing that they did was ultimately a culminating event in a museum on campus where they got to display their work and they got to um, select from their reflective, uh, their reflections on the photos um, and ultimately have their own display. Um, this is a practice session here that you see a picture of. Um, the kids were actually practicing what they did. So we learned a lot about their conceptions about how health might be different than the way that we're seeing things. Sometimes they would take a picture of a tree and say that was healthy because that's where my grandpa and I used to sit and talk. And then when the pandemic hit, um, in our lower left-hand corner here on the screen, you see the picture of a laptop on the floor of a gym. You see the physical education teacher, she's actually kicking a soccer ball against the wall. And, and I happened to be at school that day. The teachers were in the building, but all the students were home. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm teaching my soccer lesson from afar. And I said, who's on the other end and what are they doing? She said, I told them to get any ball that they had. And then I told them to start kicking the ball against the wall. And here were the teaching cues that I gave them. And I said, we can do better. We can do better than that. So we actually started a GoFundMe page for PE toolkits. And when we started the GoFundMe page, one local yoga studio found the page and then challenged everyone in Central Texas to match her contribution of $1,000. Before we knew it, about 48, 72 hours later, we had $10,000. We had um, PE toolkits um, up in the left-hand corner. I have my daughter stuffing the PE toolkits. Um, she needed some hours uh, as a senior in high school. And then in return, we asked the students to do some videos, make some videos for us. So I'm gonna show you pieces of these videos and the sound doesn't really matter. But this student here was asked to create a physical activity workout where she could engage by only using what was in her home. And these were the resources that she had. And I'm gonna let that video run. In the other two videos here, there were students who were asked a challenge, try to find an object you could bounce the ball off of and create the correct angle so the ball could land in the basket. You could choose any basket. It was really meant to do a layup at home on a basket that was either in a community park or you happen to have a hoop in your yard. But as you can see, most of the children didn't have access to that. Hola, voy a aventar mi pelota en la caja y de la caja tiene que, que caer en la pelota, en la canasta. She's explaining to us the task is to bounce the ball and make it land in the basket. Voila, excellent job. I want to show you a slightly different interpretation I'm here. I'm going to be doing the, the bounce off challenge. This is my ball and this is my basket. And I'm going to be right over here, right here. So I'm going to be trying to bounce on that wall to there. 
I bet I'm going to do it first try. So he doesn't have the conception of angles or okay, basket. No he does have quite a bit of positivity. I'm going to get it on my first try. Not yet. And this goes on for quite some time. So I'm going to stop it right there. Do I really believe that this is goal oriented physical education that is increasing motor competency also is creating a positive affect towards physical activity is creating an understanding of concepts well no it's not the formalized educational instruction that we all want it to be but if you're at home and you're on the couch and you're not doing anything a pe toolkit um, by selecting the ball out and then choosing a basket at the home when you don't have a basketball and a basketball hoop to shoot at it was something. It was something. And think about all the other things that we gained from doing this, an understanding of the living circumstances, an understanding of the primary language within the household, an, oh, under yeah. an understanding of what individuals had access to. And that really helped us to see things through the eyes of the students. So we had the photo voice project. We had the PE toolkits that went home. We asked them to post a video of them attempting to solve some of the problems that we pose. I don't have time for this tonight, but in part of my research, what I do is neuroimaging. In that neuroimaging, I quite often collaborate with uh, Dr. Charles Hillman from Northeastern University. And uh, we have learned so much about the causality between physical activity engagement and physical fitness. And so the notion of us at least getting individuals to expend energy and engage in physical activity, we knew that we were getting neural activation that we weren't gonna get if they were at home on the couch or they were in isolation because their parents had to go to work. Um, or they had to wear a mask and they weren't able to engage with their peers like they once did. My current work actually uses FNIRS and virtual reality. So we take these circumstances within the lab and we think about from a tightly controlled circumstance, how can we look at the hemodynamic response of the brain? And then ultimately, what does that look like in the daily lives of children? So here on our left-hand chart, this is after a nine-month intervention. Um, and that intervention was a physical activity after school program. And ultimately, those who were waitlisted went home without engagement in that program. They have that cool blue, which has lack of neural activation. Um, the others have um, superior neural activation, um, significantly different in the switching task, which is cognitive flexibility from one task to another. And then in the incongruent task, which is they could block out all the interference you know, other things that we take for granted. You know, there's lighting in the back of my picture. There's other people in my household right now, but I can block those things out. A, ch a child that may have ADHD, a child that may just have an impulsive disorder, it's difficult for them to navigate and identify which one of those stimuli are most important. I took these learnings that we had in the lab I coupled them with the notion of what we were doing um, within our community engagement project. And we developed what we call Project SMART. Um, don't have time for the video, um, but you can, you can certainly see it on our website if you'd like to at some point. We call this Project SMART. Project SMART um, is an initiative that I worked with an engineer who designed a, a software mechanism where we can have children use their Chromebooks, log in, fourth graders are trekking across Texas because that's in their Texas essential knowledge and skills, their state learning standards, and fifth graders are trekking across the United States. We ask them to record their physical activity. As they record their physical activity, this is based upon um, a prototype that was created in Kids Go Green in Italy. Um, they work cooperatively as a class across that journey. So it never really puts it one child in a position where, well, you're not contributing to the class group. It is the aggregate score that the children always see. And it's really tied to real world situations. You can see the bottom icons where we have El Paso, we have reading time and we have San Antonio. Those are each learning modules, which I'll show you in a minute. And then there's also rewards that children receive along the way, like extra reading time, um, extra physical education time or extra time uh, at recess. 
children report green, yellow, or red for their engagement in school physical activity. And they also on Monday mornings have an opportunity to report out what they've done on the weekends. Yeah, it took some training up. Um, students, some students, uh, you know, would be very little activity and, and physical education, and they would press the green button and say, you bet, I had a great class today. Hmm, are you sure? So we actually use the daily, this is our daily exit ticket, and so students place their ID card on the top of this box that you can see, and then they badged in with green, yellow, or red, and then the teacher could provide feedback. So if they felt that the student was right on track, then yeah, you know, today you're a yellow. Yeah, today you're definitely a green. They could provide some feedback. If they were off base, they could, um, you know, certainly refocus the child and then say, should you rethink that green where you're really a green today? And this coaching up and the providing of feedback through accelerometry um, really increased the amount of, uh, of accuracy, particularly among the fifth graders, they seem to be developmentally ready for this. We used class data for math problems, and we used it for the weekly two minute math assessments. So we use their own data, again, the philosophy of the citizen scientist, families collecting their own data, using that information not thinking of data as a dirty word, but using that information for advocacy purposes. We started to build calendars of how many days per month did your class actually achieve green. We created um, not only the system where you can now see in this particular slide, the learning activities that are all um, standards-based. Uh, they were designed by teachers um, during a summer boot camp. Uh, they told us what this is the content that I need to cover. I can't, I don't have time for physical activity in my class. But if you make that physical activity about the content, then ultimately we'll be able to engage in that activity. It's not appeared on the slide. But we have uh, one of the modules is actually build your own accelerometer, then using a micro bit processor and using scratch code. The children in fifth grade actually use coding to create their own accelerometer and then they get to take them home. Thank you, NSF. And thank you, NSF, for the training of teachers. The teachers told us if this is just going to be one more thing that I need to do in the classroom, I don't have time. So we allowed them to customize the intervention by their class and their needs, how quickly they covered the content, what teaks you needed to cover by when, how can we display the data in a way that children can utilize these to meet a math learning outcome. Um, they had to take the bar graph and then change it into a line graph. They had to interpret the graphs that they saw of the progress of their class. How could they change their behavior in relation to their own data? So instead of this notion of it's something scary that researchers do, no, it's just numbers. It's a graph. You're learning that content in this way. The last piece that we have that's not quite in place yet is a phone application and a dashboard where families receive their data back. And it can be data about, there's one square there that's about the allergens um, that are actually in their home. And so they can receive some information about that, the outdoor temperature, um, how much sleep they, their children um, have gotten. We had a little thunderstorm come through uh, early this morning. Um, and you know that would be something that they would report and they can share their data, we can share their data back to them. There is also one other mechanism on this where they can, can share a concern to us and we need to respond to that particular concern. So it could be that in the park there was broken glass. Um, it could be something to the effect that um, they're worried about a street light that's out in their neighborhood. And then we can take that data and we can share it back to other communities. And these are just some of the projects that we've done. Free helmets, a sensory motor lab, um, we gave out soccer balls and seeds. Um, you could be a scientist for a day. Central Texas Food Bank did demos for parents and their cooking. We had tabling physical activities where you rolled a giant dice and then you played a physical activity game. And then we also offered some mindfulness and some yoga classes. <sighs> a lot, but fun and amazing and um, transforming. 
Um, let's think about what this all means for all of us together collectively and our discipline and our work and our communities, which are all unique. Sometimes I think of change as the squeeze ball effect. We're there, we intervene, we help, we make a difference. And right after we leave, it goes right back to the way it was before. We thought deeply about this and we're not quite sure what to do, but we know that we don't want to be the squeeze ball. We know that we don't want to make change and that change is only made because we were present or because we had access to resources that other people didn't. We wanted to think about how this could be sustainable and what are the logical next directions that we needed to go in. We think of everything as data. We think of how many people who showed up at a tabling event. We think of a concern that emerges from the community. We think of how all of our programs, whether in school, at the clinic in the School of Nursing, or within our community for recreation purposes, how those programs can be driven by that data. And we think about that's how we need to make our decision. We see it, we feel it, we touch it, we make an observation. It's there again when we go back. There is some reliability and validity to that data, and then we act on that. A community engaged approach or participatory based model ultimately is not for the faint of heart. You have to roll up your sleeves. It takes quite some time to build those relationships. And yet in an instant, we could mess up and lose trust. It's risky, but I think from what you heard so far is it might be worth it. It might be worth it to engage. So how is it that you can engage teachers in that way and parents and you as physical activity leaders can make this happen? How can we as scientists provide data that goes back either in real time or close to real time to advocate for the needs of the people in that community, school community, university community, or a combination of all of those? How can we co-plan together and make sure that when there is a question, a really valid question, why does my water smell? Can we share that information? Is it just this home? Is it all the homes in the neighborhood? And how can we get people to act on that? I love the fact that I'm being pushed out of my discipline and that my discipline is being questioned because number one, what I realize is I do have skill. I have something and you have something as physical activity leaders that no, no one else has. You have an understanding of development. You have an understanding of the inner workings of schools. You have an understanding of the politics of education. You have something to offer. Don't ever devalue that. Thrive on it and bring it to a team that you can assist and you can help. In the same vein, I learned so much about environmental hazards that I hadn't even been thinking about, but the ventilation system within that gym, I'm asking them to run, and yet the kids with asthma are being exposed to the allergens within that, that system. I'm now thinking differently about that. Our social workers taught me to think differently about families in the family unit. What models might be the best? I don't know. We need to think about that. Um, what models uh, might be best for this community may not be best for your community or another community. And we have to think about how we define those communities. We started by zip code, and then we discovered that the region of interest to us had four different zip codes. One school district, but four different zip codes. And three different counties within those zip codes. So who was someone to turn to in that particular community because there were resources coming from all different places. Um, and it actually is, you know, um, Dr. Jones who suggests that maybe we should take collective action in our learning improvement and redesign and rethink how we, we engage in, uh, from a design perspective and how we can create these uh, communities of practice and the community of practice addresses a concern that comes forward. So thank you, Dr. Jones, for um, making me think about that. We could also utilize some models that have emerged over the last couple of years. For example, MOST or the multi-component optimizing strategy that allows us to at different time points in the intervention to make change based upon what we have learned. 
wouldn't it make sense? You don't have to wait until we do a whole year of a reading program that is not working. We can change it as we go to help adapt that um, intervention to what our children need the most. Same kind of philosophy, except in this way, it takes a, a health oriented approach. So everything that we're doing in schools, we think health first, and then of course we evaluate and reflect and step back. Some tips and suggestions here as I'm moving towards closure. Um, what are some school-friendly ways in which we can conduct uh, research within, whether it's the community or the school community? Remember schools, particularly public schools, are designed to be inclusive and to involve everyone. Going into a research study and saying, well, you're excluded from my research study because you have an IEP. You're excluded from my research study because you're a wheelchair user. That is not the approach that we take. We take that everyone's going to be involved in the research study. And yeah, there, there may be a time where we can't utilize that data or we have to come up with alternative methods of data collection. Involve everyone, don't be exclusionary. And the notion of randomization before we create the waitlist control you're having this wonderful after-school physical activity program. Parents are relying on that program for childcare and for the child's physical activity in that day. Children in this particular school district only have physical education two days per week for 45 minutes in the elementary school. They have it for a semester daily at the middle school and first year of high school in ninth grade. The other semester, they don't have any physical education. So, if you're making a promise of a program and it's gonna have desired outcomes, randomize before and then say, well, I'm sorry, you weren't selected for the program. Think about how we can evaluate the models that we use and that we can capture that evaluation and then learn from that evaluation and share it back. And so here are some things to consider across, you know, becoming a certified teacher, being a teacher educator, being an educational researcher, partnerships, 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 you'll see across each one of these new ways of thinking, a paradigm, systematic reviews to figure out where to start, but then listen to the community and then respond. We know this from science, but we also know that that science didn't include a Latin X participant. Does it hold true, our findings? to this particular community that I'm working with. So we think through that. And I leave you with this. I leave you with this. And I'd like you to reflect on it and, and find your way of rising to the challenge, right? What are you doing in your sphere of influence to help children thrive? And it could be something really small. I'm a great tutor. I'm a great babysitter. I have two great kids of my own. What are you doing in your sphere that's gonna make a difference? because it takes a village to raise children. And the second one is, what is your curb cut effect? This has evaded me in my career. It's that one really, really simple thing that we could do to make things cost effective and easier for everyone. The curb effect is about access. It costs money to build ramps. Ramps get in the way to raise a wheelchair um, over the curb. Curb cut effects is, all we have to do is flatten the edge of the curb so that everyone can have access to the same amount of resources. So what's your curb cut effect? I haven't quite found mine yet, um, but I'm not stopping. Uh, this stuff is too fun and too great. I thank you so much for this honor. Um, I thank you so much for being here tonight. I, I can't wait to hear what your questions are about this because I've thrown a ton at you. I'm also thankful for all of our collaborators, all of our funders, um, and the work that we do at the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Costelli, for that enlightening presentation. So now we're going to take this opportunity to um, open up to, for question and answers. But before we do, um, I wanted to announce that our School of Kinesiology and Recreation held a question and answer, um, essentially like a contest. And uh, Reagan Fallis is our winner. Um, they are one of our exercise science students. Reagan, you will receive an email from Dr. Manieri. Um, on how to pick up your free KNR uh, t-shirt. So uh, Reagan, Reagan, I also have a copy of a book for you. If you give me your address, I'll send you a copy of our book. 
Woo, that's amazing. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and start with our question and answer. We have a couple of them. Um, first one is from uh, Dr. Emily Jones. Uh, she wants to know a little bit more on um, how we begin to build stronger transdisciplinary research to practice and practice to research teams. Um, specifically, she wanted to know in what ways do we rethink how we are training future professionals so they begin to seek out and experience transdisciplinary as the norm in how we solve critical social issues. Yeah, Dr. Jones, I, I think one of the first things is, is I undervalued um, perhaps the talents that I had and the expertise that I had in understanding child development and understanding research models that were community-based. Um, and I didn't know that I had that to offer other research teams. Um, I think it's about reaching out to others who may be doing similar work. Um, I think it's about one of the things that we did was we just had a series of webinars and, and we use social media. And so I would present my work and a webinar and then several people would attend that webinar. And maybe it was 10 to 20, but two people would come away and say, I'm doing the same thing or something similar in the School of Social Work. Would you like to get together and have a cup of coffee? Um, I, I think it's about getting your word out. I think it's about utilizing technologies and social media in a way that you can make connections. I also think it would be great if administration stepped up and offered some of these opportunities, uh, a day of mentoring, a day, a research showcase. Uh, we have a research showcase for our undergraduates, graduates, as well as our scholars. And what's wonderful about that is you get to know what's coming out of Christine's lab or what's coming out of Carrie's lab and two of my collaborators. Um, I didn't have an awareness of that. I think it's great when I can then ultimately involve the undergraduate students, graduate students, and my colleagues simultaneously. I think those are the best days. Um, they are fun-filled because an undergraduate will have a certain responsibility, a graduate student will have a slightly different responsibility, and we're all in it together in the Kinetic Kids Lab. So maybe those are a few tips to, to get started. Um, it's great when you can in, integrate an internship or undergraduate research mechanism um, into the problem that you're trying to solve. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so now I actually have Reagan's question right here for you. Great. <laughs> I'm taking the book back, Reagan. Yeah. Well, that was my fault, not, not theirs. Um, in your work, have you found that youth experience more benefits from certain types of physical activity? For example, playing active games versus doing traditional exercises? Uh... Okay, so I think it's also culture and contextually grounded. I do think there are certain benefits to certain activities. For example, let's say that you have a group of high school students who have never done Tabata before. I see that as an opportunity to share what I know about Tabata to help those um, high school students understand that there's we don't have to do team sports all the time. Um, this can be a high intensity workout and it goes really quick because it's fun with your friends. Um, so I definitely think that there's differences in physical activity. There's certainly differences in the cognitive benefits by intensity, exercise type, and also the notion of the type of cognitive activity after that. Um, so Reagan, I would, I would challenge you to think about how in your experiences, uh, you could offer a variety of activities um, and uh, try to allow individuals to explore in that environment. And um, yeah, certainly it's based upon interest and choice as well. Okay, another question that we have from an anonymous attendee. Uh, with your findings, how can this help college students in their mental and physical health being? Um, what is the best advice for instructors as well as for students? Yeah, so I'm going to give you an example, a non-example, and then an example, okay? <laughs> so the, the example is that it's, that it's okay to feel stressed out. It is okay to have bad days. Um, we all understand that there, you have competing responsibilities. You might be working multiple jobs. It might be that you can't get your internship. It might be that you didn't sleep well last night or a relationship hasn't gone as well as you think. 
stress is real. The management of your mental health is really important and self-care has value. So think about how can I exhibit self-care practice to um, keep an eye on my mental health? How can I surround myself with individuals who can then support that? The non-example is this. The non-example from my research is you can't just do 25 jumping jacks before the exam and I'm going to do better on the exam, right? This is habitual engagement and physical activity. This is healthy decision-making on day in and day out. Can you eat birthday cake? Absolutely, it's your birthday. Yay, I want you to celebrate. Can I have, consume a beverage? I can absolutely consume that particular beverage in certain situations could be soda pop. But I also need to think about my mental health, my support systems, and then I come back to the notion of having a bank of coping strategies, especially now. It's so important for you to engage and we get it. We want you to be at your best. Um, so think through that, take pause and be mindful. All right, another question that we have. I keep them coming, by the way. I keep them coming. <laughs> um, so what influences you and motivates you day to day being associated with kinesiology and recreation? Yeah, I, um, good question. Uh, well, first of all, I think it's the students. So it's, it's all of you who are here on the call today. Um, it also is the K through 12 students who I may not see on a daily basis, but I, I do about every other week get out into schools. Um, I, I think that's my motivation. I think it's sharing what I know and having opportunities to share. Like this is wicked fun for me, right? So some of you might be, um, you know, that's, that's not what of, of interest to me. What good is any of the knowledge that we just have created unless I share it with others? And it brings me great joy to do that. And I'm not happy unless I got it full throttle, right? So, you know, students, sit back, put your seatbelt on. Here we go. We're going to learn together. And um, it's just more fun and enjoyable for all of us that way if uh, I'm super enthusiastic and um, students uh, reciprocate with that and it drives me to do even more. Thank you for that. Um, as far as one more question here, unless there's gonna be others, um, yeah, feel free to keep them coming. But uh, the question that we have is, in what ways can we prevent researchers from being a quote unquote squeeze ball? Yeah, well, you know, if, if whoever asked the question, if you would like to provide the answer, that would be outstanding. Um, I think so often we go into communities, we intervene, and then we move on to the, the next project. Uh, we are not, uh, you know, malintended. We're not being nefarious. We're just busy people. And um, uh, we have to move on to the next project because that's part of the system that we've created in higher education. To prevent being the squeeze ball, um, I think it's about relationships and building those relationships. I, I hate to keep harping on that, but I think there's some simplicity to the notion of uh, being very humanistic in our approaches, learning from others, um, having a disposition where we, by seeking to understand, we're actually enhancing our own well-being. So there's something to learn from every situation and whomever we're interacting with. Um, and I think we have this obligation to then turn around and if the data can make a difference, then we need to build some sustainable systems that allow that circle to continue, right? So the question emerges, we do our best to answer that question and sometimes we fail in our attempts, that's okay too. And we, and we collect that information, and then we find a way to get it in the hands of individuals who can make a difference. And I think that, plus the notion of community engagement, where they are co-partners in research with us, I don't know. I, it's pretty magic right now as we're on our journey. You can have me back in five years, and maybe I'll have my head down and I'll say, we failed in our attempt. Everybody moved out. You know, there's no one left in our community. There's no participants left in our study. 
uh, we didn't do a very good job. I don't think we're headed that way. I think we're headed in a way where we're going to be successful and it's going to be sustained. Um, but mobility in the United States is a very real issue. Um, so we have to keep building those relationships. And when a key stakeholder moves away, we have to build new relationships and find new partners in that community. We have to be a steady force um, in that research. And it doesn't happen if we uh, walk away or give up really easily. Great response. So we got another one in if you're still ready to go. Yeah, sure. All right. So uh, were there any barriers or pushback from funding agencies when you needed to shift or pivot within your longitudinal study? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think we face those concerns. Um, I don't know if it's on a monthly basis, maybe it's on a quarterly basis. Uh, why have you expanded the scope of your study? We're confused why uh, we have expenditures for care packages. Um, that's not what each line item in the grants was dedicated to. Why are you now hiring a community engagement specialist that's gonna create care plans for families? we had to ask permission to reallocate the monies because um, the monies were designated for certain expenditures. We experience um, barriers from the funding providers. We experience barriers from each other's disciplinary jargon. Sometimes um, we're trying to figure out which variable is more important right now is, is poor water quality in one household and they cannot cook with that water, does that take priority over physical activity? Um, well, they're both important over the long term. We have to stop back, catch our breath and decide which one immediately right now in the moment is more of value. And is there a way that we can actually move forward with both of those concerns? How do we overcome those barriers? Patience, um, take the data, utilize the data to have discussions with the funding sources. Keep pushing our colleagues to um, have an appreciation for community-based research. For those of you who are early career scholars, that might mean that we have to push on administration just a little bit to change the merit document, spoken like a full professor. Um, we need to have deliverables that are actually part of the inner workings of higher education, but yet think about how we could still have reach and be compassionate with community members at the same time. So yeah, it's not easy to navigate. Um, it's a lot of work. There are a lot of meetings. Um, I'm the chair of the PIs right now, and um, I do get pulled in, in different directions, but I try to listen to all and say, this seems to be the most logical choice in the moment. And again, um, I, I try to do my best, but sometimes it's, it's not ideal. It's not. So thank you for the question. So we have time for one more question. Sure. Uh, what type of grading scheme do you find most appropriate for determining developmental progress, improvement and or success? And how do you think students should earn their grade in physical ed education? Oh, a great question. Uh, yeah, did you have to finish with this one? This one's a tough one. Okay. Um, I, I think I've changed my thinking along the way. Uh, and, and, and I'll just reflect on my own experiences. Uh, in my undergraduate program, you had to be competent at 80 different gymnastic stunts. Competent. You had to demonstrate competence in 80 different gymnastic stunts. Well, I like to think of myself as a pretty good athlete, but 80 is a high number. And so to think that my grade and progress towards a degree in physical education was based upon my performance in these 80 stunts, I got super creative. I went to the men's apparatus. I used the women's apparatus. I, <clears throat> my floor routine was the most creative thing that you've ever seen to pass this class so that I could get to my 80 stunts. And I did see the value of that as I was going through it, that I needed to be able to demonstrate those skills. I saw the value of my dance class. Um, it was a cultural experience in my dance class. I hadn't been exposed to some of that music and some of those dances. But to think that 
those competencies were the only reason to move forward. Um, I think a holistic perspective, having certain competencies that are relevant to the daily lives of teachers today, I think, um, honestly, I wish we didn't have to give grades. I wish there was a way that you, a student could, and here's my, I'm grading my stack of tests right now. Um, I wish there was a way that an undergraduate student could perform in front of me and say, you know what, I learned this. And I would feel more comfortable with that. Um, it is the system that we have created um, because there's a purchase of accredited hours and we have to be held accountable for, for that. So I don't really wanna get into the, the grades debate, but I think certain competencies are necessary. Being an effective communicator is one of them. Being able to have an understanding of child development is really important as well. Um, the application of what is developmentally appropriate for our child in this moment, what are the tactics of the game? I don't think we're at the point where we need to recite the height of a volleyball net or the width of the volleyball court. We can look that up on the internet now. We don't need to do that. What we need to do is say, what's the first way that I can expose children to the sport of volleyball? Well, they're going to strike and they're going to forearm pass and they're going to handle this. So I'm gonna back out of that one and I'm not gonna give you a full answer of portfolio summary assessments or um, you know, the requirements that have been put in place there. Um, I do think you need to demonstrate that you've learned. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to the quality faculty members that you have to make a determination of which is the best assessment there. Thanks for the challenging question, um, but I would like some evidence that you have learned as part of the program. Thank you, Dr. Castelli, for your answers. You're welcome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Hoffman, for facilitating that dialogue. And of course, to Dr. Castelli for sharing your insights. I'd like to close tonight with just a final formal recognition of our lecturer this evening. Um, yesterday, I think Dr. Castelli received in, a in the mail a plaque commemorating her lecture. Um, oh, and there it is right there. Awesome. I'm glad it made it. We're glad it made it to you. Um, Dr. Caselli, we present that plaque to you as the 2021 Esther Larson McGinnis Scholar Lecturer. Um, we also have a companion plaque in the home of School of Kinesiology and Recreation, McCormick Hall. Um, since we couldn't host you in person, we wanted to make sure that you could see the newest addition to that plaque here. So we're going to go on a bit of a, a photo tour of McCormick Hall. Um, here's our upstairs hallway with our School of Kinesiology office and all of our plaques. And oh, look, a great uh, plaque here for our ELM scholar or lecturer. And if we zoom in just a little bit, we have a new addition to that plaque, um, Dr. Darla Castelli. You. Uh, you'll forever be part of our Redbird KNR family. Um, let's see some clap hands in the chat for Dr. Castelli since we can't, uh, <laughs> can't give her uh, some visual, visual props. Really, thank you um, for your contributions today. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, for the students in attendance, um, you'll please sign in to the lecture uh, by filling out the form that I just dropped into the chat. Um, and on behalf of the School of Kinesiology and Recreation at Illinois State University, I'd like to thank one final time Dr. Castelli and all of you for joining us tonight. I wish you a great rest of your evening and thank you. Have a great night, everyone.